Hey, hey, my name is Jeff Willinger coming to you live from European SharePoint Conference. Although, wink, wink, I'm not actually in Europe and nor is Edward, but I will tell you, we wish we were there. Uh, I'm in Southern California. Edward is in lovely Arizona, and we are still coming to you live from the US, beaming all the way through the technology of Teams. And now my Viva background. Super psyched to have Edward on today. Uh, we hope to be at uh, European SharePoint uh, Conference for sure next year. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, I think they're having some other stuff as well. So uh, again, just uh, my name is Jeff Willinger. I'm the managing director of Zilio. I'm actually based in the Netherlands uh, in Amsterdam and uh, a migration services firm. And uh, Edward, uh, I've been seeing Veeam at every SharePoint conference. I'm an MVP. Uh, amazing branding, um, but who who really? I, I all I usually do is like grab your amazing giveaway, but I sure. don't really take the time to find out who is Veeam and what do you guys do. Sure, absolutely. Well, we actually are one of the leaders in the backup space, so we've really become uh, from those early days of virtualization where we were really the first to market uh, to, to backup virtualized environments to really now becoming uh, really one of the, if not the number one backup solution that delivers modern uh, data protection. Uh, moving from those early days to now 400,000 customers worldwide, uh, we're in 30 different countries in terms of our offices and employees. And uh, of course we have many different partners, um, 35,000 uh, technology partners. So definitely from those early days, uh, encompassing now all workloads, uh, cloud, virtual and physical, and uh, of course, integrations with, with many different partners as well. So you're sort of behind the scenes because at the end of the day, I'm saying to myself, why do we really, doesn't Office 365 sort of back up on its own or like why, why would I need, I mean, again, amazing branding, uh, but why would I really need, you know, someone like a Veeam uh, as part of my solution? Yeah, you know, Jeff, and that's been a big part of our education process in the market these past few years, because there are a number of surveys um, that basically explain there are a variety of concerns that organizations have, um, such as accidental deletion or user error, uh, retention policy gaps in the case of thinking things might be protected when they might not be. Um, of course, internal security threats, um, rogue uh, employees or consultants, um, external security threats, ransomware, right, is huge uh, in terms of those risks. And then, of course, legal and compliance. You know, why not have a backup that you can easily recover from and maybe get a little more granularity um, in your re recovery methods that really allow you to get timely um, uh, legal and compliance requests answered, um, you know, uh, compared to what you might be able to do in the out-of-the-box functionality. So that's that's what we've we've really uh, taken to heart is just let's educate the market and help people understand that really when it comes to Office 365, it is a shared responsibility, right? So ultimately, users have to understand that you know this is both a give and take. So users have the responsibility of the data. Microsoft is in charge of things like the infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure level, the data center, the data center geo redundancy, keeping the service up and running. That's the responsibility of Microsoft. But clearly there is a responsibility held to the user where they have to protect that data. So we're very passionate about educating the market on these reasons. And um, certainly traction is being made. I think you, more users are realizing the light bulbs coming on. Yes, I do need to protect this critical data. Uh, very, very interesting. It's the type of stuff that, you know, sort of like the G word, governance. People don't really want to talk about it, but you sort of need it. And I'm finding it's it's really the same as uh, with Veeam. Um, any details around, I mean, all your partners, so would you partner with a, a solution integrator, perhaps systems integrators, or who's sort of selling your services? Sure. So we have partnerships with many global service providers. Uh, we also integrate with the leading hyperscalers. So think, you know, Azure and AWS. And uh, of course, we even have S3 compatible uh, storage providers. If you think of the Wasabis or 
uh, some of those guys, of course, IBM Cloud as well. Um, so again, it's it's providing the customer options. That's what Veeam has always been about. We're always about flexibility in terms of what storage you use. We don't lock you into a particular storage uh, like maybe some of the other guys. It's all about what you want to leverage. If you want to leverage a hyperscaler, great. You know, we've got tons of integrations there. Um, if you want to leverage a service provider, get that backup taken care of. That's all. That's all good as well. We have a, a huge ecosystem of service providers, so um, the choice is all all up to the user. That sounds super interesting. I I, I actually had no idea that uh, you were really you scaled like that across. It really doesn't matter what the platform is. Right. Very interesting. Um, have you been traveling at all? I mean, have you guys been doing? I know you've got your Veeam uh, branded shirt on. Uh, are you planning on being at any conferences? I'm running down to Orlando uh, in about a week and a half for the uh, M365 Collab Conference. Uh, are you guys partaking? We are participating in that as well. That's actually probably one of our very first events we're coming back to, and and we're really excited to see people back in person. Um, it'll be interesting, right? It's almost a little bit of a social experiment. Let's see, let's see how people adjust back to back to traveling. I think it'll be very interesting to see all those all those smiling faces again. I think that uh, I, I'm part of the uh, collab. I'm one of their advisors, and I think they're debating either on your badge or wristband to say if you're vaccinated or not. Okay. I know Walt Disney World currently has got that thing where you got to wear your mask when you're out and about mm -hmm. but maybe that will be eased in a couple of weeks when we get there i know california june 15th no more masks wow um people yeah. are starving and you you, you nailed absolutely. that absolutely uh, absolutely you know, social and, experiment yeah and jeff we we actually got off the tailwind uh, this week actually of our our vmon events uh so of course, we would have loved to have had that in person, and we definitely look forward, hopefully, uh, to an in-person event next year. So um, I know that our customers and partners are just just really, you know, like you say, chomping at the bit, really trying to trying to get the, that traveling, that business travel, get uh, back together and get us all get us all back in the in the same room again. So I I've actually lost like I've lost a considerable amount of weight in the past year by literally not traveling. I literally get to right. work <laughs> seven days a week and between Orlando, then right after Orlando, I'm running down. I'm taking a couple of days. I'm meeting my brothers and my dad and the islands there. Nice. So uh, I better start continue to watch what I'm eating and continue to really crush it while before I start traveling again. Yeah, I, I can relate. You'll you'll pretty much eat anything when you're on a business trip, and uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely watching what keeping keeping that keeping those healthy habits, no doubt. That, that's for sure. Uh, what when you're in Arizona, and it sounds like you're not originally from here. Is that what type of accent is that? English, English, actually. English. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do you have a sport of choice? That uh, are you a footballer or what? Uh... So. Yeah, actually soccer. So I think maybe some of my uh, my European friends here uh, would know. Actually, it's football, the the, the football, right? Uh, yes. with, that you play with your feet. So soccer, yes. Uh, I do. I am a big big football fan, uh, and certainly looking forward to the World Cup. Of course, you know we we wait years for that. So I'm already looking forward to that, and uh, yeah. Definitely. Good. Well, I'm glad that it wasn't on one of the, the COVID year because that would have been right. not amazing. <laughs> no. Absolutely. It's crazy. It's sort of fun seeing the, the games now, but, you know, you miss, uh, they're letting certain, uh, the Premier League, are they letting certain people in? To my knowledge, it's mostly still closed, um, unfortunately. And I think that goes for a lot of sports. There's still, you know, there's there's still quite a few strict guidelines around those those stadiums. So um, I I think people fans of course um, similar to the IT community I think the fans can't wait to get back uh, into the stadium and support their teams. I think that's that will be fantastic when we can all do that. Yeah, it looked like in Dallas I'm a big basketball fan, or I should say uh, playoff basketball fan uh, down in Dallas, full capacity. But in LA last night watching the Lakers game. Actually, they played Phoenix, uh, probably about a third of the uh, fans. Though uh, I'm not going to say I'm an, originally a New Yorker and then Chicago. 
uh, the LA fans are not nearly as vocal as uh, as back on the East Coast or in Chicago. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we like to we like to drink our kombucha. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Edward, this has been super educational for me, and I hope for everyone that's listening, uh, Veeam has been an amazing uh, partner for uh, European SharePoint Conference, ESPC, for a number of years. And uh, I know speaking on behalf of ESPC and all my friends there, they run a, an amazing conference. Sarah, Ella, Kevin, the whole team uh, really does an amazing job. So I thank them. And Edward, I really appreciate you taking some time to spend with me today. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to the audience here, feel free to come by the booth, check out uh, a demo of Beam Backup for Office 365. Great. Well, uh, thanks again, Edward, and uh, thanks to our friends at ESPC, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye. You too. Thanks, Jeff. Bye bye. Okay. Hey everyone, this is Jeff Willinger and I'm coming to you live from European SharePoint Conference. However, I'm not in Europe and nor is Naomi. We're here, I'm here in Southern California and Naomi is up in, uh, we'll just call it the Microsoft area in the great Northwest. And uh, super psyched to be talking to Naomi Moneypenny. Naomi, you and I have known each other. Gosh, I don't even know. I should have looked it up before we started talking. <laughs> uh eight years nine years at least at least <laughs> yeah i think you were like 20 when i first met you so you're just <laughs> turning 30 so happy birthday no i'm just kidding um so uh super psyched to join uh to join me today and uh really thrilled to be a part of uh european sharepoint conference for the fourth year for me so uh naomi tell us about uh your role at microsoft um yeah, t tell us what you tell us what you do at Microsoft. Sure, I'll be happy to, Jeff. Thank you. And yes, it's great to be at ESPC. I wish we were all in person, but I know it will be in the future again. So I do love that event so much. Uh, it's awesome. So great to great to be able to talk with you all at least. So yeah, what do I do at Microsoft? I have an awesome job at Microsoft. Uh, and one of the things that I do is to look after product development in the knowledge expertise and culture and communications areas. Uh, and so it's a really, it's a great role where I get to look at all of the different capabilities that we have inside of Microsoft is all kinds of cool tech that's in the company. Uh, lots of new AI tech that we're working on with uh, Microsoft research and other areas. And then think through with our customers, importantly, like what it is that you would love to see in the products that we have. And some of that is really taking us on the journey with Microsoft Viva and building a new employee experience platform and all of the capabilities we need in there, but also investigating some of the newer things that we want to do, especially in the culture and communication space. So it's an exciting role. Uh, I get to lead an amazing team uh, from a product development perspective, a great engineering team, and uh, we're remote uh, across the world at this point. So uh, even with the pandemic and everything else going on, uh, it's been an amazing journey to build new products that you've seen in terms of Viva Topics, uh, Microsoft Viva Platform, SharePoint Syntax, the updating of all of the managed metadata services that happened last year too, uh, and then some new things that are on the way as well. <laughs> Naomi, if we were playing uh, buzzword bingo, I definitely would have had bingo by now. I like you said, it. Yeah, uh, the SharePoint word. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I think that organizations are trying to get their arms around, what do I need to know? Where does uh, sort of, is Cortex the overriding project Cortex? Is that still a thing? And then is Syntex a part of it and Viva is a part of it or is Syntax a part of Viva or is Viva part of Syntax? And then they're all a part of Cortex. And <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. Help, Project help Cortex, I, I will help you, I will help I you. See an infogra I see an infographic in the future <laughs> on this. 
No, I think Project Cortex is the essentially what our team name is, right? So I think that's where this confusion comes from. Before we had all the great naming that we have for Microsoft Viva and the employee experience platform, uh, we wanted to kind of keep that under wraps, if you will. And so Project Cortex was our code name, essentially, uh, that we shared with the outside world to help develop some of the new areas. And so when we we're looking at this kind of big content services area, we were looking at both uh, what we could do to improve uh, what uh, employees need need every day, which is save you time and save you money, which is where SharePoint syntax came from, uh, understanding how to make subject matter experts into having low code models and no code models of AI that they could trust and process a bunch of information from. And so that was really where syntax came from. And then we were looking at topics as well. So thinking through like, how can we mobilize AI across the company to create a system that helps you form a Wikipedia essentially for your, your organization. And so we were looking at this very holistically, right? And we still carry on with that in that mission, right? So just because we have the V1 of those products out there. Uh, that's all part of the, the goodness that we're developing and continuing to work with customers uh, and partners uh, to make sure that that offering gets better and better as well. And so when you think about this, you know, you know, Project Cortex carries on. It's just the team name, essentially. That's the way you should think about it. Uh, and then we're also continuing on with improving uh, both the products we have, but also looking at new areas of capability and functionality that we need to deliver as well. Very interesting. Uh, and where I've been seeing Viva in a very short period of time is I've been building intranets for the past 15 years. I've built almost a thousand of them. And I know in the past, being a, a tech consultant, um, we were always looking to not necessarily get one of the third party add ons, but really get the most out of the box, if you will, out of the box SharePoint. I would be at a cocktail party and I would tell someone, yeah, I'm a SharePoint consultant. And, you know, you get like that sort of scrunchy face. Yeah, we have SharePoint and fill in the uh, derogatory next line. But I will tell you in the past couple of years, when you tell people you're a SharePoint consultant, it's not as bad as it used to. And I've got to tell you, my my Jeff J. Willie vision shows me that in the future with Viva, especially Viva Connections, which we really haven't talked about a lot because it's the sort of the free or whatever. The front door, the front door into the employee experience. Is Thank you, about yes, <laughs> because uh, the employee experience, the employee journey uh, within an organization is key uh, to, to retain employees. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you think about it, that employee experience platform that we're creating with Microsoft Viva, so it starts off, we've got these four modules, right? But there's a lot more to come as well as part of that. And so the first one is Viva Connections, as you mentioned. And so that is the goodness of SharePoint, essentially, uh, with all kinds of great uh, capabilities on top of that. And so that's kind of the front door into the employee experience platform, if you will. And um, so that's available obviously right now in desktop and then we're working on it for, for mobile. And so when we think about that place for, for people to connect um, and understand what's going on in their day, understand the news, understand the feed that they need to see, the dashboard essentially uh, for them, that's a great place for, for people to do it. And we look at these other modules, which are also very exciting. So Viva Insights, for example, helps to give you insights on your day, how you're connecting with people, how you should be looking at uh, focusing on your time. Uh, and that really helps with the idea around employee well-being and also giving you things like manager insights. Uh, so if you're managing a team, uh, it can help you to understand maybe some stresses and pressures that are going on inside of your team and give you appropriate nudges so you can spend time in a new and different way. And so it's really thinking about that, you know, employee at the center, if you will, with these different modules. Then, of course, there's Viva Topics, which is the work that we do in terms of knowledge and expertise. And so thinking through, like, how do I understand the knowledge that's available in my company? How can I actually have a system that helps me to create and to gather up all of that knowledge and then have folks be able to come in and curate that information as part of it? And then lastly is Viva Learning, which is extremely exciting because we want to look at learning in terms of, again, thinking through holistically, what do you need as a support along your employee journey? And that might be different when you're onboarding, but it might also be through the entire of your um, of your career, right? So it could be things like soft skills, as well as things like compliance training is other things that you need to do, but really connecting in with all of the different learning management systems that you have, bringing that in a great way and being able to surface it up into the flow of work. So we're really excited, right? It's 
it's those four modules that get us started with Microsoft Viva. We put the employee at the at the center and we look at everything around, you know, thinking through from well-being, culture, communications, the growth, the learning, the talent development, as well as the knowledge sharing, and look at all of those things together uh, as Viva. And then more and more capabilities will come into that, of course, as we learn. Uh, and then, you know, working through with, with customers implementing it. <laughs> Very interesting, and let, let's. I, I want to stick with that employee experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, successful employees, successful successful organizations retain employees. In fact, uh, I was reading a Gartner study. Actually, I think it was McKinsey, and they said that um, fifty one percent lower turnover and eighteen percent higher productivity for employees uh, who are <clears throat> socially engaged at work. And, uh, you know, the word social scares the heck out of most employers, right? They're like, oh, we don't want employer or we don't want our employees to be social. But if you interchange the word uh, collaborative, all mm -hmm. of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, we want them to collaborate. We just don't want them to be social. I mean, mm -hmm. which is sort of like <laughs> a joke, right? I remember I was at a, a firm a million years ago and you walked in. I remember we did a lunch and learn and we brought in pizzas. And <clears throat> when we were coming in there, the employees were filing out. And I said to myself, wow, is there a fire drill? What's going on? Well, it turns out <clears throat> when you walk into their offices, there are signs everywhere. Follow us on LinkedIn, like us on Facebook and this and that. But uh, their HR policy said that you could not use Facebook or uh, the social networks when you were at work. And it also there was a, a cell phone deadener when you walked into their office, you know, so I, when everyone was leaving, they were probably all looking for new jobs or like, you know, checking in on stuff saying, man, this company sucks. I, I don't know. But it was just an interesting, you know, that sort of it, it really wasn't a culture of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I look at projects like, you know, if we're going to install uh, Viva, in fact, at Zilio, we're building out an incredible uh, Viva practice and and part of that is really making it easy to do making it easy to do your work right uh, have that sense of belonging and inspiring right um, those yeah. are the two most positive employee feelings about work right a sense of belonging and then you're inspired to do your work and guess what Naomi in the short period of time we've been talking I get that from you and you probably get that from me, how I feel about Zilio. Uh, the funny thing is just over 60% agree or strongly agree uh, that they have that sense of belonging and, and that they're inspired by their work. These are two indicators of the quality of the experience. However, only about 48% feel their employees are empowered. So figuring out how to do that and the thing is, we're so used to having great experiences on Facebook or Instagram or wherever everyone's hanging out nowadays, Clubhouse. Um, make it easy for me, make me feel wanted and important, and I'm going to do a great day's work. And especially now with uh, with, with everyone working remotely, not everyone, but so many people working remotely, um, it's, it's hard, right? I think that uh, pre-pandemic about 30% um, uh, nearly half the employees will work remotely at least some of the time now, right, post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, it was about 30%. So figuring out how to still have an amazing employee experience and uh, really you, almost using the employer as a social safety net, right, um, and figuring out how to do that is going to be really important for successful organizations uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it really is uh, looking at the benefits, the business benefits that you get from having provided a great employee experience, right? And that's the one of the areas that we're really coming from it from from that perspective. As you as an employee, we're all employees, right? We we know uh, what a great employee experience feels like. You need to feel supported. You need to feel like that sense of belonging, as you said. It's also that sense of recognition for the work that you're doing and that connection to understand your function within the company's uh, overall strategy, right? And so even if you're 
you're the CEO right and all the way down to a first line worker, right? You want to think about that connection and does the work that I'm contributing to get reflected into the work of the company overall? And do I feel good about, you know, being part of that uh, that organization and advocating for the things that that's it's part of? And so when I think about that employee experience platform, it really does build on all the great collaboration goodness that we have in Microsoft 365. But we also think through like here is all these other systems that people have to deal with every day, right? Uh, all of these different systems, it's difficult to get your work done. We don't want to put barriers in front of people to get their work done, right? We want them to be happy and productive, right? Uh, and connecting with each other at work. And so we want to make a great experience for that. And that idea of really looking at this holistically, right? People are the greatest resources that you have inside of a company. And we all know that, right? We talk about it, we say that, right? But we don't actually recognize it in, in the same way. And so really thinking through what can you do? What can technology help you to enable being the best place for that person to work, right? Really giving them a different value proposition and really looking after them holistically, right? It's not just about their productivity and did they get their things done this month? It's like their well-being, like how are you valuing them? How are you growing them as a person? How are you helping them to get the talent development that they need? How are you helping with them, uh, you know, help them manage their time, right? So thinking through like focus time or is there time when they need to disconnect and make sure they're with their families, that kind of stuff. And so you want to look at that holistically for an employee, for people to be happy, right? When happy, productive, uh, we all get more things done. And then the business results just illustrate that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that speaking of, we were talking earlier about both of our careers, how we have ended up where we were. And I remember when I first met you, you've been talking about this harnessing the knowledge and expertise and finding the experts in the organization. Gosh, Naomi, 10, 15 years. I know you've got a number of different patents on different things as well. Um, and I, I said to myself when I first met you, man, you are way before your time. And here we are nine, 10 years later. And, you know, they could have called this money penny uh, topics and connections. Uh, I love it. Uh, I do love the name Viva. Mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to like. Um, it's the energy, it's life, right? That's what we think about it. So we want to have a great work life, right? And so when we think about Viva, that's really what it's all about. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So in your role, I mean, what keeps you up at night? What are you thinking about when you're, when you sort of uh, power down, if you will? I know Satya has really been passionate about, you know, I, I hate to say the phrase, you know, work-life balance, um, but um, what do you like and the wellness, you know, and the healthiness of employees, what are you doing off hours that, you know, is sort of firing you up every day? Uh, I was constant thinking through, I think, on, on our product, uh, obviously, directions or strategy or approach. Uh, how are we making our customers happy? Uh, constant interaction with customers, which is amazing. And you get to learn so much uh, about all the different cultures that people have inside of their organizations and how can we have things that help to support all of those different cultures, right? Uh, and so I think through that a lot. And then, yes, I get the, you know, their, their mindfulness, you know, reminders as well, right? And so it's really interesting to, to look at that. So things that I previously had not engaged with before, so if applications like Headspace that we have as part of, of Microsoft Viva, like things I had not actually uh, interacted with before. And I was like, hey, I should try this out because I haven't done that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I'm trying to be a great, obviously, manager for our, our team, right? And so I have the same pressures that many folks have out there, which is like, how do I create a great employee experience for my team? And so we want to use all of the tools and tech that we have. Uh, but it's always that constant, like, how do you be better? How can you be better, right, as part of that, too? <laughs> That's great. Uh, what are you looking forward to? Hey, uh, supposedly this is going to be the summer that we're making up for from last summer. I hope so too. I hope so. I love to travel again. I think we were all just desperate to do that. I want to see my friends. Obviously, I want to go somewhere warm and sunny. It would be amazing. And <laughs> I'm, I'm running down to uh, the collaboration conference in Orlando at uh, the beginning of June. And then I'm running over to my former hometown of Chicago for SharePoint Fest at the end of July. Are you jumping into any either of those? 
I'm not planning so far to, uh, and that's just it's one of those those areas where I'm trying to figure out what the travel looks like next as well. Um, so I do want to get back to to that, and then I, I think the other big piece of it is just sort of exploring those different areas, right? So thinking through like, hey, the travel we were doing before, I felt like we were on the conference circuit a lot, if that makes sense, right? And we do a lot of these different conferences, and then it's like, okay, I need to take some some time, right, when I'm there uh, to understand and meet some different people and different inter-perspectives, inter I would say, as part of that. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm going to be a bit more mindful about as well in the future, uh, is to make sure I'm going to have great quality conversations as part of our community events. Um, Jeff always talks about this, Jeff Cheaper, sorry, always talks about this being the, the best community in tech, and it really is. And so I think about European SharePoint Conference, I think about all the amazing SharePoint Saturdays, uh, I'm going to do a keynote for for one of them coming up for uh, SPS uh, Chicago, I guess, too, as well. Oh, yeah. So do those. And uh, yeah, so those those community events are incredibly powerful, and it's something uh, folks need to tap into even more, I think. Um, and that's where I'm going to try to spend more time uh, as well. <laughs> Yay, as one of the community leaders here in Southern California, we appreciate you and <laughs> I know how to get a hold of you sometimes. <laughs> um, let me see what else. Uh, uh, God, there was something that was on top of mind. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm heading to Amsterdam uh, this fall uh, for to my, so my corporate headquarters. I'm based in Netherlands, mm -hmm. Amsterdam. And I happen to be very passionate. Maybe you've seen some of my posts on pickleball. I don't know if you've experienced pickleball. I have not played yet. I have a person on my team who loves pickleball and she's she's desperate to get us a big tournament going. So sometime yes. in the future it'll be happening soon, I'm sure. Invite me up. So yeah, I'm gonna do a, a riverboat cruise on the Rhine from Basel to Amsterdam, and it's a pickleball cruise. Awesome. So that's something that I'm definitely looking forward to um, this fall. Uh, are you a movie goer? Uh, not so much these days. I'm a, I'm more of a gamer these days. So if I if I have to admit to something, that's going to be the thing. So I do play. There's an arcade game that I have here, uh, but I also have an Xbox S, which I really enjoyed, and uh, still, uh, yeah, and the Oculus and and those things. So a lot more, uh, a lot more Beat Saber in my future. <laughs> I'm afraid. Very cool. And have you been participating in, uh, you know, the um, I, I know we did the virtual marathon mm -hmm. and the alt space. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. So, of course, you know, one of the things I worked on early on is uh, one of the great product teams uh, is the SharePoint spaces team. Right. So the mixed reality piece of it there. Uh, and that was a, a great uh, adventure there and still an amazing product. So if you haven't seen that recently, folks should check it out, right? Being able to bring mixed reality directly into your experiences in SharePoint and build an environment there. And so that's a, a great one. That was a, a great place to work from a uh, perspective of bringing this new cutting edge technology. And now, of course, in you know our normal consumer lives, right? We see it all over the place. Uh, and so it's it's been really, a uh, really fun journey there. So, yeah. I am I am a bit of a closet gamer from that perspective. <laughs> love it, love it. That was like a sort of fun fact about Naomi Money Penny. Yeah, you know, uh, I did the virtual marathon last year too, and Joel, Gail, and Ryan, they're all running around. We had it at my house here uh, with their headsets on and, you know, doing all the stuff that you do when you have those headsets on. And I thought, man, no one is into this. And now I'm an MVP at one of the last MVP monthly uh, meetings. They're talking, hey, guess what? It's going mainstream. It sort of has to, Naomi, right? I don't think the conference circuit is going to be the exact same in the future, but I think that having it virtual reality so you could actually see the Naomi in third world or whatever it's called, uh, or SharePoint spaces, is going to be kind of a cool way to uh, save money and attempt to have that same type of experience. Yep. No, I think it's it's just an exciting direction, right? We we launched a bunch of things from Microsoft around Mesh and uh, looking at how to position those services of the future. Obviously, the investments we made for SharePoint Spaces has been a great one too, and that's a, an amazing product team. They just continue to just 
churn out amazing, uh, making it easy for people to do mixed reality, right? Right there in a SharePoint site, right? It's just like adding web parts on a page. It's amazing. Exactly. So I, I think it's just, it's an awesome one. And I, in my, in my opinion, like you think through like that employee experience piece of it, right? This is a way to create these shared spaces with people that you haven't met before. It's a way to create a place for people to go, right? You know, say you're a first line worker and all you have basically behind the scenes is a store and a break room and that kind of stuff, right? You need to have a place where you can actually go and, and explore and understand more about the company or the organization that you're affiliated with, right? And that's that's a way to do it, right? Mixed reality is a great place to do that. And so it's a good thing from learning from an immersive perspective, but it's also just a great direction to understand and consume resources visually uh, much faster. Uh, and so I think as we're just, again, seeing that, that cusp a little bit on the business side or the enterprise side of actually implementing some of this tech. Um, but I think it's a, an incredible enabler for the future. Great. Well, on that, we are going to wrap up. Uh, Naomi, I'm noticing, I mean, I think that I'm sort of coordinated, but I noticed your beautiful orange paisley blouse. I don't know if it's a coincidence, is matching your gorgeous uh, leather retro chair behind you. Uh, it's I don't a coincidence. Know. <laughs> I did not plan that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that we're pretty color coordinated. Of course, you've got the Viva purple in the background uh, on your sweater as well. So, uh, I compliment you and uh, I thank you for spending some time with our amazing viewership. I mean, European SharePoint Conference, well run, organized, great content and fabulous. The organizers are amazing. Everyone from Sarah to, you know, the entire staff, Sarah, Ella, the entire staff. So thank you to Share European SharePoint Conference. Naomi, thank you for spending some time with me. I'm going to turn off the recording now and then we'll wrap up. Let's see. <laughs>
ERP system, HCM systems, and and uh, others, right? Uh, CRM systems. Uh, no matter if that's SAP or Dynamics 365, doesn't really matter. And um, but that those are the systems where you already have a certain control, yeah, and where you where you're investing a lot of uh, yeah effort actually into putting putting in the data and. Uh, uh, that is needed um, to drive processes and to automate processes. And in that way, sometimes integrating via APIs and so to say, attaching open text document management functionality, so to say, to these leading business applications is, uh, via integration and via API is, is serving the same purpose, right? It's about, um, yeah, serving the, the end customer with with the document management tools that he needs when he needs them in his procurement order to cash process or whatever it is. Well, I think that's a, that's a great segue into the, in a, the second question, getting more in depth into this. So for most organizations, uh, you know, obviously aligning their uh, business applications with uh, content management collaboration is essential. Uh, and, and how does open text approach the, this integration. Yeah, well, uh, we have uh, different. So first of all, we have a long history. If you look at, you know, analyst reports uh, like Gartner and things like that, you will always find out one of the strongholds that where we invest a lot of time and effort in is into is into really um, applications uh, that that have deep integrations into these leading business applications so that's kind of our core business right and and we are providing not only integrations to our platforms no matter if that's on the document management side or if that's on the digital experience side and things like that uh, into those systems but um, i fully understand that this is this also means speaking about the wallet of the customer at the beginning, right? Uh, that that you are investing into a bigger solution, right? Because actually, let's take a procurement example. Yeah, you have an invoice management solution uh, attached to your ERP system, and uh, and you want to process and automate the process of uh, hundreds of thousands of invoices that your company receives, right? Yep. Including OCR capture and all those one machine learning, ideally automated recognition and, and things like that. Yeah. So we are doing that, but obviously such an integration and, and application also costs a little bit of money to be fair. Right. And, um, and, but there are also other tools out there that uh, give you the promise on and try to give you the promise to make it a lot simpler by by maybe plug and play and uh, and integrating so to say via these uh, yeah platforms so to say um, and and achieving the same purpose. I think I think yes um, when you look at it and when you it it's an architectural decision. It is. It is also about volume, it's about uh, speed, it's about accuracy and things like that. And there's always going to be a difference between an application with uh, deep integration and APIs and things like that versus, uh, let's take, you know, RPA as an example. Yeah, there are a lot of RPA vendors that also do maybe then invoice management, but in a completely different way. And maybe it's good for a couple of hundreds of invoices, right? But maybe not for uh, telecommunication companies and, and millions of invoices. Well, I think it, and I think that's a, a great way to, 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 to also kind of go next with the third question. As you think about you know, integration and, and the rise, the increase in all of these third party, you know, cloud-based services, for uh, process automation and uh, specifically integration and thinking about the big picture of the solution that you're trying to architect. So, you know, how does that increase or the rise in cloud-based services impact the digital process automation story from OpenText perspective? 
Yeah, well, I, you know, first of all, uh, I think it's, uh, like I said, yeah, we, we've we taken the approach that we are, we are definitely investing and, and uh, building applications with deep integrations, right? And uh, yes, I fully understand that uh, very often it seems easy easier to 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 take for example um the promise of an rpa vendor or a, a a platform like power automate to automate certain tasks which seem to achieve the same goal but i think it's also very very often a decision in regards to you know governance control security when it comes to governance control security um yeah right looking looking at the end the end-to-end -end solution versus just that one piece of it, right? Right, right. because uh, if you take an RPA uh, vendor and application, it probably means you're sending and passing around a lot of data, right? Because right. the goal of RPA is actually exactly that, to bridge different systems and silos, yeah? And that can only work when you're passing around, so to say, uh, data, right? Um, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's an architectural decision that each customer that each uh, that you would have to do as an as an architect, so to say, at at the customer when you when you want to design such a solution. I think what I think is really cool is that um, in the meantime there are a lot of options to automate tasks, yeah, and to and to digitalize uh, tasks. Um, it becomes easier and easier. Yeah, I think it's not yet there where it's uh, completely plug and play, even though all the vendors are striving to achieve that, right? And uh, it comes with uh, certain caveats and uh, there's always a different uh, difference between, I believe, an enterprise application that's directly built, giving you UI integration and giving you that seamless user experience, so to say, from the main platform, from the main system and platform, versus a you know task-based kind of automation. Um, that's the big difference, I think. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the scalability. The you know it, how enterprise-ready a lot of those solutions are too. You know, a lot are are not built for the transaction level. The you know that much data to move in a daily basis, and uh, and then of course have the auditing capability of all of those to have all the security governance uh, you know, capabilities um, built into the platform as well. Yeah, all things that you need to think of that broader scope. Yeah, totally agree. Well, thank you so much for your time, Bert. Uh, and thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, enjoy the rest of the ESPC conference. Hello, ESPC community members. This is Christian Buckley, Microsoft MVP and Regional Director over here at AppPoint. And I'm talking today with Eric Overfield, Microsoft MVP and Regional Director and the president of Pixel Mill. We're yes. talking about remote first. So, hey, Eric, how's it going? Hey, how are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. ESPC 21, the remote edition. I love it. Super cool. The remote edition. That's a, you don't have to pay extra for that, folks. You just get that. So, uh, so question one. Let's jump in. Yes. Great topic here. Question one. What does remote first mean? Yeah. So this one is totally interesting to me. Uh, for those of you who know me, I, I come back from the the, the des web design days, and and uh, we used to talk about mobile first in development. So this idea when you're developing the web page, you should develop it for mobile users first. Well, in in this new work environment we find ourselves in, there's this new phrase that I, I've heard that I really latched on to, which is this idea of remote first. When you're building your digital workspace, when you're adding components to your to how your, your organization is going to work, I, I believe strongly you need to be looking at it from the remote user first, that how is this thing we're going to do? How's this process we're going to work with? We're going to build this great new conference room. It's going to have all this stuff. Okay, great. Remote first, though, how are the remote users going to interact with this? Because to me, 
this remote user component is not going away from most organizations. Effectively, every organization I'm dealing with, there's no desire to move away from so at least they're not going to go 100% in office anytime soon. And, and anytime soon to me is, is years. I mean, not decades, but but many, many years. So remote first be, being and be permanent for a lot of roles as well. I I personally would think that it we're, we're not going back. That's kind of my thing. But I, I never say I try never say never. So I look at it. What's what can I say in the next five years? And I just don't think a lot of people are going to be working five days a week in the office, uh, four weeks a month or whatever it is. Uh, anytime soon, if ever. And so we need to build the tools within our organization that empowers those remote workers because they're going to be, there's going to be a lot more productivity they can gain, in my opinion, by being remote in some ways. <clears throat> but some of us are going to be in an office and there's benefits to being in an office in some ways. And so we need to have our tools, our digital tool set, uh, address that. And to me, it's remote first. How is your remote user going to be just as effective as your uh, in-office experience uh, employee? And that's going to be the best benefit you can get, in my opinion. Well, question two, I think we're going to dig into this because yeah. this, Microsoft is talking a lot about the future of the hybrid workspace. And I think that's partially covered by the remote first you know, concept. But with the increased focus on remote first and hybrid workplace, what are the major issues that organizations that are going to run into that they're going to need to manage? Yeah, so quite a lot of things and, and some things that are interesting to me, it's around the collaboration component. So the other places we can go with this, but what I really want to talk about is the in a conference room experience where, so you know, people are at a desk at an office, or people are at a desk at their home, they're going to be productive, great. To me, the office experiences are really about that where you're able to communicate with someone a little more easily because you see them in the hallway, you can just huddle in a conference room. And I am a, a more of a visual person. Like when I'm thinking I want a whiteboard, I want to draw things out. It's hard just for me to, to envision complex spreadsheets and graphs and charts and concepts unless I can draw it out. If I draw it out, I'm good. So having a conference room where people are able to meet is I think important and it'll be very valuable for a lot of people. Okay, but what about the remote user? Now, pre-pandemic, when I was in a conference room of 5, 10, 15 people, and there was one, two, five, 10 people on the phone, effectively, the people on the phone almost never talked. And I think you probably saw this too. And when I was on the phone in a big conference room, I get it. You can't read the room when you're not there in person. And it's hard to interrupt. And you kind of just start multitasking in ways because no one can see you. And you just, it's not good and effective. Okay, we can't have that. And so to me, the hybrid work environment, it, it's going to happen. People are going to be in conference rooms more. We need to set up that kind of collaboration in a way that is just as effective for the remote user. And the remote user is equally responsible here in, in how this is set up. So to me, those tools that are interesting are things around teams with all the different views they're creating so that you can uh, be on camera. So this is like rule number one on camera, like period. Uh, just always have that on. But when you're in a conference room with your fellow workers and you're remote, have your camera on, it gets you in place. That camera better be on in the conference room and set up well. And the new experiences on Teams where you sort of, they feel like if they're in the conference room and they see you, you feel like you're part of it because they're seeing the, a good view of, of the, uh, the remote attendees all lined up. You can then interact and work well within Teams. Uh, the different virtual whiteboards that are available and the Teams Hub whiteboards and ways to allow your remote users to be able to draw on that whiteboard is just as easy. The way that the remote users can read the room so they know when they can say, hey, I've, you know, I got to speak up and people can see, oh, hey, you know, you see that person who wants to talk. You know that that happens in a conference room. You need to enable that. So one of the hundred ways I can think of right now answering that question to me, that's one of the really big ones for me is the hybrid experience in that conference room because the collaboration is so much of what this whole thing means like to me so well one of the difficulties that i have again historically you look at you know pre-pandemic and a lot of the things that we're doing in real time the synchronous collaboration the mm -hmm. improvements that have been great there um one of the problems that i always had was uh, and something that organizations need to think about carefully and manage uh, you know going forward is for those people that are in the field, whether or not everybody gets back into the office, yeah. when you have that asynchronous collaboration, 
to not forget about the people that aren't there uh, locally. I mean, yeah. this is something I experienced being working from home for the last decade. Mm -hmm. So the my day to day didn't change with the pandemic. Yet the what has improved because everybody else is working asynchronous hours. You know, uh, is, is that people were more cognizant of others needs of the fact oh we don't have everybody they're in another time zone we need to adjust our schedules so that we can get this input and waiting for feedback to come in where before i just constantly felt forgotten or bulldozed you know yes. the kind of opposite ends of that so thinking about the changes to the culture of collaboration inside the organization and being more aware of who are my stakeholders? Where are those stakeholders? And so that it's an inclusive process in that Absolutely. asynchronous collaboration. Yeah. One uh, that I found is also important around there is that kind of virtual water cooler and encouraging an environment where as people are starting to get into the office more and they're going to run into their their colleagues that also like mountain biking or hiking and what are you doing this weekend? Oh, yeah, I wanted to go on this mountain biking thing. And oh, dad, did you, did you want to join me or something to put that back into that Yammer or Teams community that you had? And I, I think encourage that as an organization to help people with their just, you know, out, out of work life uh, experiences as well. So there are some really interesting things that we're going to be tackling. There's some other more mundane ones about like um, uh, trying to uh, reserve offices or reserve conference room or reserve desks and things like super that. Super exciting yeah. topics, yes. A super exciting. That's that's the issue. They they don't interest me, but they're very important. Like I get it. And the hybrid workplace is going to have to uh, encourage and, and enforce some of those rules and provide the tools for people so that it's easy and seamless. I, I do like the office experience. I think it's very important. It's it's sort of like the conference experience. I really want to be able to go back to an in-person conference. I'm looking forward to being back at ESPC, hopefully 2022, and we can all be in person. Uh, but then remote is also valuable as well. It, it saves on a lot of time uh, on travel and stuff. So, uh, you know, there's pluses and minuses to all of it. And we just want an environment that uh, really address that. Yep. Well, for question number three, quick and easy one. So focusing more on the technology itself. So for organizations who are struggling with remote and hybrid work, uh, where do people start? So what are your recommendations for tools, apps, uh, and services? Kind of where do you point people where they can get kind of most of the, more of the bang for their buck? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'm i going to give you the, um, I, it's not the best answer in my opinion, and I, there's a reason why, but the problem is I actually believe this strongly. I have drinking this Kool-Aid. You need to start and fully embrace and understand Teams as I really do call it in this, and I believe it, the operating system your digital workspace. You need to start there. You need that to be your foundation. You need to understand it, accept it, realize what that means. And just that's, it's it's such a powerful tool that pulls the rest of your digital workspace together. And it, it's remote first to me. It, it, it follows along those lines. It's where all your tools are going to live. But even in your in office, uh, we were using Teams when we had an office before all this stuff. And it already was becoming that operating system before we really knew it. It is absolutely there, and it's something you need to look into. That being said, of course, there's room for improvements for Teams. So uh, the Teams mobile app for me is not always as consistent as I need it to be. It can be a little slow sometimes. I believe strongly that the engineers at Microsoft fully understand this. And when I've had my chats with them, they are some smart people, and they're working on it hard. That's the kind of commitment I want, and they're making it. Of course, I wish they could move faster. So uh, really embracing that as the the hub of where things are going to start, I think, is important. From there, there's all these tools you can add to it, and, and the, the fun things like Viva Connections, adding that on the whole Viva platform, actually, I think is really useful. But those are, you know, there's 100 of those tangents. But accepting and, and really embracing Teams as the hub of it, that to me is like that step one. And not just, oh, yeah, we use Teams. Everyone uses Teams. I get that. We all do. But how integrated is it in, in the digital workspace? Is it just a communication tool or is it really where you're focusing your efforts to bring everything together? Well, this is, again, I think it, it specifically ties back to like your information architecture and understanding oh, yeah. how teams being used. And so creating, like even having a more f formal provisioning process so that you're yes. setting up and you're managing the life cycle of, of teams. I mean, there's a yep. lot of work that to be done there yep. besides yep. just using teams. It's great. Yep. It's being, it's growing so rapidly. It's being fully embraced. But yep. now, now you need to do it well. <laughs> Correctly. 
Yeah. yeah, you might need to go back and clean up the mess you just created over the last 12 months. Uh, Microsoft is focusing on that as well. They're creating templating around this. Uh, their power platform can really help with provisioning processes and and governance processes as well. There's lots of third party apps out there uh, from all different feature sets, all different price ranges, all different approaches to looking at this. I, I believe this is going to be a very healthy ecosystem for a while while organizations attempt to understand a actually very complex thing in the SharePoint world where where you and I both come from. Information architecture was so important and it was this big thing. And like, Sue Hanley was just the person who I always went to understand that. In teams, you still need the same idea of what are we doing here? What's the purpose of this? How are we going to do this? And 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 what kind of conversations are we going to encourage? And where are we going to have many to many, one to many, private channels, um, uh, private teams? Uh, where can external people come in? Naming conventions, governance policies, backup retention, all sorts of very important conversations that need to occur. That are just oh, they're so much fun, of course. But it's something that we really need to think about and. Put effort in, and it it follows to me that remote person mentality because effectively Teams is available any place, anywhere. As long as you have an internet connection, you could be on vacation in Hawaii and still be plugged in. And maybe that's not good and bad for personal mental health, but at the same time, a lot of us need to be connected. We need to be able to just see that chat that comes in, and we want to be able to to be able to address it. And Teams is a great tool for that, in my opinion. It's the tool. About every other meeting now, I'm seeing somebody who joins in the office, then they switch it off in real time, switch over to their mobile while they're walking to their car, yeah. then they're yeah. in, driving, underway. And so, yeah, the flexibility there, uh, it is yeah. uh, it is evolving and changing the way that we're thinking about collaboration, that's for sure. Absolutely. I, I'm I'm not fully concerned. I'm not fully convinced yet or like, I don't know how to consider think, okay, so I'm in my, I'm at home, I'm on a Teams call, I need to get the office, so I switch to my phone and then I get into the office. How did I drive there though? I don't really want to encourage people to be teams while driving, but right. at the same time, it at least allows you to listen in or something. And you can just tell, and this has happened to me uh, when I'm having uh, weekend calls with partners and stuff, and they have to, uh, they they just, they need to move on a Friday afternoon or something, and they'll just go to listen only and they just tell me. I don't even notice they switch by the way, which I do love that. So yeah, I mean, there's, the hybrid workplace is like that. There was a really good, I think it was the last Ignite uh, where Jared Spataro did a 20 minute, the hybrid workplace. Um, it's on YouTube now, I'm sure. So that'd be what, Ignite 2021, Jared Spataro, the hybrid Microsoft 365. And yep. any demo of this stuff. And it, it, I do believe a lot of us are going that way. I've seen it personally. So I can say that, yes, I've seen organizations do it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I believe where we're going. Awesome. Well, thank you, Eric, for yeah. your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And, of course, enjoy the rest of the ESPC conference. All right. Thank you all. Bye.